All right, so I'm gonna get started here. Hello and welcome to another installment of Special Collections Summer Seminar Series. I'm Jenna Silver, the Processing Coordinator Archivist, and today I'm gonna to dive into kind of the nitty gritty details of archival processing. Uh, the steps and procedures we take to prep, process, and make a collection accessible to the public, and also touch on some of the unique items that myself and my colleagues have discovered while working with materials, processing, or just kind of digging in them. And in today's talk, I will be focusing on the processing of physical materials only. While the procedures for digital materials is relatively similar, there are some differences and larger concepts at play when dealing with digital archival materials. So for the sake of keeping the scope narrow and focused, I decided to only cover processing of the physical items that we have. With that, let's jump in and discuss what archivists actually do. So I wanted to start off with this meme that I stumbled upon, partly because it's pretty funny and kind of does reflect the many ideas or the job roles that archivists do. And as you can see, there are varying degrees of what people think archivists or processing librarians do, you know, ranging from, I guess, saving the Declaration of Independence, being, of the, being the keeper of the deepest archives, filing, data entry, processing, boxing, you name it, we kind of do it. And while most of these are correct, well, maybe not saving off the Declaration of Independence, but to some extent, archivists and processing librarians are a little bit of everything that is shown in this image. But what do we really do? How do we define what an archivist is? So the definition of an archivist is short and doesn't really give any clarity, still leaving others scratching their head on, okay, what is this person doing? So example, according to the Oxford Dictionary, they define the job as keeper of archives. Okay, cool. But what I'm going to dig into is what we do, how we do it. Um, so with that, I want to focus on the archivist duties. And I want to draw attention first to the graphic on the right. So this is the circular cycle model of archival materials life cycle. It's a mouthful. But this is a great model to represent the life cycle of materials, but also highlights the role of the archivist when they're dealing with these materials, dealing with bringing them in, managing them, and then just keeping them preserved for the lifetime that they're here. And on the left, you'll see the duties, like the very generalized duties of an archivist. We have accessioning, processing, finding a description and management, barcoding, collection management, rehousing, some light preservation, and access. We are responsible for providing as much access to our materials as we can. So here we are, we have, we're accessioning, collecting, organizing, preserving, and maintaining control over and providing access to records that have been determined to have long-term value. And the records maintained by an archivist can, can consist of a variety of forms, such as paper materials, artifacts, digital materials. And it's the archivist's job to take those materials and organize them in a fashion that is easy to understand and provides the most access to the public, all while highlighting and preserving the historical, historical content, importance of the materials, and the provenance. And once the materials have been managed and made accessible, it is then the archivist's job to provide collection maintenance during the lifetime in this, that they're in the stacks. This latter part is something I'm going to dive into a little bit later, as it is equally as, as important as receiving the materials in, if not a little bit more. So now that a very rough idea of what an archivist or processing librarian is, I'm going to discuss the steps we take when processing the actual materials. But first I want to clarify what I will be discussing. I will mainly be sticking to a broad, all-encompassing ideas for the sake of time. There's a lot that goes into processing, and unfortunately it cannot be covered in 20 minutes. But with that, let's begin our journey through the processing cycle. So 
we first have accessioning. And here at Iowa, we have a very streamlined process on how we go about receiving the materials, assessing them, storing, processing, and creating finding aids. When we receive materials, either through purchasing or donations, we need to accession the materials into our holdings. Accessioning means a lot more than just plopping it into a box, slapping a label on it and saying, woo, we have it. Accessioning is a process and one that allows the archivist to really start to get familiar with the materials they're dealing with and really familiarize them with how they should be organized. And so what it, what it involves is I have this graph here and we receive the materials or we retrieve them depending on how they come in and we assess the materials so we know how many boxes, the condition of the boxes. Um, that way we can ensure if there's any damage that's recorded. We remove all materials and assess for any damage. So think water, mold, bugs, tears, smells, foreign objects. I've opened boxes and I have found literal trash in them because some donors will just pack up their whole office kind of sweeping everything into a box and send it to us. So it's up to us to really work through and make sure that there's no damage to the actual documents that we are trying to preserve. And then we move on to rough sorting, or as I like to call it a rough, rough sorting when we first start. We take detailed notes of the materials condition, the different formats of materials that we're receiving in, uh, how much of each item, if it can easily easily be counted, then we rebox into archival folders and boxes. We note the new number of boxes if that has changed. We create labels, find a place to store on the shelf, and then we write up a processing plan. And the majority of these steps are pretty straightforward, but I do want to touch on two of them, uh, two that I think are very important and essentially vital to the creation and processing of collections. And the first one is rough sorting. So this is the precursor to actually processing the materials. And rough sorting is the process of dividing the materials up into clearly defined categories. So think correspondence, photos, biographical materials, and they are just very generalized. There's no alphabet alphabetization, no chronological order to them, um, which is nice. It just kind of gets an idea of what we'll be dealing with. So there's no need to break it down any further than the generalized category, and it helps identify what exactly has come in and also help address any potential conservation needs or issues that could arise. And then finally, this is one of my favorite parts. This is the processing plan. Once accessioning has been completed, notes taken, a processing plan should be created. This plan is a document that captures the details of the materials and the intellectual properties, size, format, condition of the materials, historical value, societal value, university value in some cases, this document is also a way to write out a thorough plan on how the materials should be organized, what they should be housed in, and how the finding aid should look. All this informa information is also important to record as it helps establish a processing priority, which is how long a collection could take to process and how we need to break it down to provide even more access and also estimate the cost as we're trying to provide that said access. This document is extremely important to help better maintain incoming materials and establish consistent processing practices. So now we're getting into the depths of archival work processing. And at this point, you know, on this journey, we have received the materials, accessioned them into our holdings, made a processing plan. And so now processing can get started. This is a big task depending on the size and intensity or how granular the collection needs to be. And I'm going to discuss processing priorities and processing levels. These are concepts that help an archivist assess and choose how the collection should be organized and how this will be reflected into a finding aid. 
These two steps are extremely important when dealing with archival materials. They essentially are guidelines that tell the archivist or another processor how they should go about when they get to this point. And so with that processing, you know, it's this act of surveying, arranging, describing, and performing basic preservation activities on the recorded material of an individual, family, or organization after they are permanently transferred to an archive. This helps provide intellectual and physical access and promotes good collection management. There's original order versus archival order, and this can all be addressed with processing priority and processing levels, which we're gonna dive into right now. So I've made this nifty little graph. Um, we first, we're gonna start with a processing priority scale. And it's a rating that archivists provide collections on how quickly they should be processed. And this is established based on, you know, is this collection going to be heavily used? Is the information vital to another collection and needs to be processed? Does the donor agreement dictate how quickly it should be processed? All of these things would help decide if the collection is a high, medium, or low priority. This streamlines materials that need processing to ensure they are not just sitting for decades, not being touched. This also helps create a more organized list of high, medium, and low, and allows the archivist to kind of divide it up based on their um, processing librarian skill level, their time commitment, and if there's any funding. And as you can see, we have also on the right side, the processing levels. Processing levels are how granular a collection should be processed how much description should be put into the collection and each item. There are essentially three levels, series, file, and item. The, these three levels can go hand in hand with processing priorities. The graph on the right is the most simplest of forms, meaning that in cases where a collection is high priority, we might wanna process it at the most granular level, most likely because it will have a high usage and it's just nice to know exactly what's in there. This makes research for patrons easier and retrieving items for staff easier as well. It prevents us from having to essentially reinvent the wheel whenever someone requires material from a high priority collection. Of course, you could have a low priority collection, but it still might, be, it still might require next level processing as well. These terms can go in any direction that is needed, but I wanna talk more specifically on the levels and provide some examples of finding aids that represent those. So first we have series level. Series level means that the collection is only going to be organized at an intellectual level. This is often done with collections that are low priority. Groupings or, are created such as biographical, correspondence, manuscripts, things like that. This allows patrons to still access the materials Albeit they might have to do a little bit more digging, but it also does more, it does not require a large time commitment by the archivist at that said moment. This isn't really ideal, but it can get us by in a pinch. Um, and here, this is actually a collection we are actively working on and we'll be loading it as it's done being processed. But this is what it, just a series level collection finding aid looks like. Our next one is file level. Uh, this is the Anson R. Butler materials. This is, has a slightly, a little bit more detail and has established intellectual series. Um, it has the series or groupings or of materials that they want to expand on. And at the file level, it's essentially literally just listings of files. What that means is there's usually a folder that contains materials all of the same nature. So example, in an archival folder would be a pile of letters. If given time, each folder could be at least organized by year to make research just a tad easier. And finally, we have item level. This is the most detailed and granular description you can get in a collection. This means the collections have series, subseries, files, and detailed line entries for every single item in the collection. Ideally, this means every single item in the collection has been identified and will be entered into a finding aid, but obviously that's not always the case, but it is a goal. And with that, there should be a little discussion on MPLP, 
which is more product, less process. And essentially, item level processing is an MPLP supporter nightmare. The idea of this movement is to have as many collections accessible, even if that means they're only processed at the series level. Process, processing at the item level is not ideal and too time consuming, which they're not wrong, it is a time commitment. But processing at the item level does have some serious benefits and major payoffs. And this is why these scales, the processing priority scales, the levels have been created it essentially provides some sort of balance between this need for access and visibility, but also having collections very well thought out and processed and done well. And then we have collection management. Um, this is a very important part of archival work. This is the systematic, planned, documented process of building, maintaining, and preserving collections. And I like to think of this as equivalent to an oil change for a car. After driving so many miles, one usually goes in for an oil change, a new filter, tire rotation, etc. Things to ensure that the car is safe and will continue to be safe for the next so many thousands of miles. Much like a car, archival materials that are often used needs regular maintenance to ensure that they are properly preserved and not damaged and they're still being accessible. And there are many ways to do that, routinely checking the collections that are often used. That could just mean a shelf read to make sure all boxes are there. The labels are adhering, the barcode is still on the box. <clears throat> Excuse me, all ensuring proper management and tra tracking of the boxes. A more in-depth approach is to look at the boxes being used the most and physically assess and ensure that the materials listed in the finding aid are physically there and not damaged either. This obviously can't be done all the time. However, setting aside time each week to look at a few high traffic collections and legacy collections helps ensure that materials are being cared for and preserved. Collection management is also assessing new and changing standards. And sometimes that means going into each box and fixing whatever is wrong. So right now we have found a better way to house multiple collections in one box. And this means we have to go in and physically combine them and change the finding aid. It's time consuming, but it helps with space management, better description, easier access, and it's up to standards. So now that I've spoken possibly at nausea about archival process, I wanna highlight some of the unique, interesting, and possibly mind-boggling items that my colleagues, myself, and I have come across while processing or searching through a collection. So here we have from the Stevenson's paper, uh, this envelope that's filled with these little, I guess, smaller envelopes. And if you're thinking, what could fingers and toes be? You'd be correct if you guessed fingernails and toenails. Um, we also have a clipping of Stuart Stern's favorite cow, his tail hair. Um, we also have a waffle in our collection. Um, food in the archives takes a whole nother level of conservation work. So this is very unique to have. Something a little bit more, I guess, awe-inspiring are these swords. They're military ceremonial swords. We also have this beautiful flapper dress from the Brenton Company papers. We also have this letter from horror author Clark Ashton Smith to H.P. Lovecraft, and he has signed it on the back. We also have a huge collection of fast food toys ranging from McDonald's, um, Taco Bell, you name it, we have it. We also have a lot of pop, uh, pop culture references and icons in our science fiction section, such as I'm a fan from Uncle. We also have board games, Round the World by Nellie Bly. Uh, it's quite a fun game, I've seen it a couple times. And that's, just a, a snippet of what we have here in the collections. Um, here are some photo credits, and I've also attached some vocabulary terms for anyone that is interested in pursuing some of these, these uh, terms and ideas a little bit more. Thank you.